Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist. Today, I'm going to discuss my unified field theory for gravity and electromagnetism and its geometric structure. There are critics who do not like my geometric structure at all. They think it is completely flat and boring and wrong as can be. I hope to show, by direct calculation, that the background geometric structure can in fact be dynamic. And if I do that, then, well, I won't silence the critics, but at least I'll have a silent, uh, a, a direct answer. So what is my field theory? Oh, it's right here. It is a four-dimensional slinky, or more technically, a four-dimensional wave equation, as I've written right over here. You have electric charge current minus an inertial charge current is equal to the change in the change of a four potential. I'm going to focus on the first of these four field equations, one I call General Gauss's Law. Now, there already is a Gauss's Law for electromagnetism, and I'm trying to just generalize this enough to do the work of gravity. So we have the electric charge current, and we subtract an inertial charge current. What does that mean physically? Well, if you have two charges, and they have the same sign, they do not lack each other, and so they run away. Now, in my proposal, if you have two charges, and they've got the same time, sign, they do not like each other, but they do not like each other a little bit less. Okay. Now, on the other side, you have the Laplacian operator, that uh, triangle squared, acting on phi. That shows up in standard Gaussian type laws. What's new is the divergence of the gradient, uh, the divergence of the connection. What does that mean? Well, I first have to explain what a metric is. A metric is like a meter stick. It tells you the distance. More specifically, it tells you the distance between an event here and an event later there. Now, if you go to a different place, then that metric might just change a little bit. What the connection helps you determine is how that metric changes. So by taking the gradient of the connection, then we have a very sophisticated handle on space-time structure. But what is space-time structure, after all? So we have a nice little stopwatch or pocket watch here sitting in uh, a box to represent sp uh, space. Different physical theories have different descriptions of time's relationship to space. There are three main classes. The first one is where space-time structure is presumed. An example of this is Newton's theory of classical physics. There you have time, which is absolute, and space, which is absolute. And they never mingle. Now that actually works for most of our physical situations that we're used to. It doesn't quite apply when particles are traveling very, very fast. So when you presume background structure, you are not having a complete description of nature. The second type of theory is where the background geometric structure is chosen. It's chosen because the theory will work no matter what your choice is. The theory is silent on what the, metric, uh, what the geometric structure should be. 
such a theory is like the Maxwell equations. The third major class is called background free. That means that the theory itself helps you determine exactly what the background geometric structure should be. An example of this is general relativity. There, you solve the field equations and you get both the metric and the connection. The metric and how that metric changes wherever you go in space-time. Okay. So how am I going to, uh, um, so, so what is the problem with my theory? Well, let me just quote uh, from Professor John Baez, who in, in the news group Psy Physics Research made the following critique. Instead, what really matters is that Switzer's model is a field theory on Minkowski space-time not a background field theory like the most beautiful general relativity. Now, John does not talk anything like that. <laughs> but if his critique is accurate, if my theory only works on a Minkowski space-time, then my theory is wrong. It will not explain how uh, gravity works. So how do I hope to uh, so how do I go hope to go against the good professor? Well, I think it's my theory is about the metric and the potential, and there's a real tension between the two. So what I have here is um, I'm making several technical presumptions that are also in general relativity. I presume that the connection is uh, torsion free and metric compatible. That means the connection there is really a function of a one particular uh, uh, metric. Uh, technically the connection is now called the Christoffel symbol of the second kind. And then I have this equation which you must solve. You solve it, you get the connection, and therefore depending on what the, it, therefore it's now background free because it really depends on what kind of charge density is there. That's the hope. Okay, so what calculations am I going to do to disprove the professor? I'm first going to do a neutron in flat spacetime. I'm then going to do a proton in flat spacetime. I will follow that with a neutron in curved space-time, and then I will do a proton in curved space-time. Now the good professor would agree that the first two should work for my theory. And he just doesn't realize, because he hasn't done the calculation, that it actually works perfectly fine in curved space-time. So let's do the easy one first. The first one is a neutron in flat space-time. For, for professional physicists, there's nothing at all surprising about this one. We've got our little neutron in yellow, surrounded by this Gaussian cage. And this is all about the potential, nothing about the metric. So what is that potential? That potential is the charge over R for the first component, then 0, 0, 0. Now the charge here is a little odd because we needed to get the units right. We needed to have a minus the square root of G times M because that has the same units as a, an electric charge. And the minus is necessary so that you know, like mass charges attract. And what we end up in the end is that we have the Laplacian operator on phi is just the Laplacian on a charge over R. Now that has been working for several hundred years. <laughs> There's no problem with it. Now let's think about a proton 
in flat spacetime. We're not going to change the uh, Laplacian operator on phi at all. In fact, the only thing we are going to change is the charge. Where we used to just have minus the square root of g over m, we have the, the electric charge minus the square root of g over m over the same r. So this will work for a static point source, like a, um, like a proton. And now we come to the big issue, how do we do a neutron? So we got to get rid of this charge stuff. In curved space-time. There we go. Okay. Um, well, in, we're going to make, try and make this work out so that it is no potential, all metric. So that means that if it's all, if none of it is due to the potential, the gradient uh, of the divergence of phi is not going to be too interesting. It's going to be zero. Instead, we're going to do the uh, uh, divergence of the Christoffel. Um, now, let me talk a bit about that potential. It's supposed to be boring. And the one that I use in the calculation is c squared over the square root of g, which are just two constants that get the exact same unit as charge over distance, 0, 0, 0. So taking any derivative of that is going to end up with nothing. Now the goal is to find a metric such that the divergence of, the, of its Christoffel symbol ends up being exactly that expression there, minus the square root of gm over r. Now if you ask people who are we're physicists, they might say, it's going to be tough to find that one. It's not going to be easy. But I found it. It is what's called the exponential metric. I call it that because it has exponents running down the diagonal. The first one is e to the minus 2 gm over c squared r. And the other ones are minus e to the plus 2 gm over c squared r. Now, if those exponentials go to zero, then you end up exactly at the Minkowski metric, which is good, because when mass goes to zero, you should get the flat Minkowski space-time metric. But how does it match up against tests we've already done about metric theories? It matches up perfectly. Why? Well, if you do the Taylor series expansion of the exponential metric, and the Taylor series expansion of the Schwarzschild metric and isotropic coordinates and compare them to, this, to what's called the first order parameterized post-Newtonian accuracy. Those coefficients, those 10 coefficients, are exactly the same. Gamma equals beta equals 1 and everybody else is 0. So what that means is that for tests of the weak equivalence principle, which is the equivalence of gravitational and inertial masses, they will be, both metrics will predict exactly the same thing. It means for tests of the strong equivalence principle, which is about active and passive gravitational masses, it will be exactly the same. It means that for tests of the metric coefficients themselves, such as light bending around the sun, radar reflections of, of a mercury, um, and the precession of the perihelion of mer uh, mercury, sorry, um, they will all be the same. So that is good news. If you go to second order parameterized post-Newtonian accuracy, then the exponential metric predicts there will be 0 0.8 micro arc seconds more bending for light going around the sun. So that will be a very hard test to actually do. 
The reason is that right now we can only detect bending to 150 micro arc seconds. So we have to increase the order, uh, the uh, quality of that data by two to three orders of magnitude. But once you do that, then the fact that the sun is spinning and moving and it's not a perfect sphere, it's got a quadrupole moment, all those things make little contributions to what the metric should be and it's on the order of uh, a micro arc se seconds. So that will make it technically quite the challenge. But what's more important is that at least in theory the exponential metric can be proven or rejected on entirely experimental grounds. All right. Now, what is the divergence of the Christoffel for this metric? We first have to look at what the Christoffel is, and then we take the divergence. So the Christoffel involves taking three derivatives. You take a time derivative, but this is a static point charge, so it's zero. There are derivatives that involve off-diagonal elements, and those are all zero, so those drop. And what you are left with is that you have to take um, uh, uh, the gradient of the very first term and multiply that uh, of the metric and multiply that by the covariant form of that first term. What happens when you take the derivative of an exponential is you get the exponential back and you get the derivative of the thing inside the exponent. What happens is that the exponent cancels out with this other exponent factor that has to be involved and so the result has no exponential. And what, what you get is actually the gradient of a charge over distance. You take the divergence of that and you end up with the Laplacian operator acting on the charge over R. You end up with exactly to the letter, no commas, minus signs, different with the exponential metric. So we can explain the, uh, the field generated by a neutron in, as being due entirely to, uh, to the connection. And that will tell us how the metric actually changes throughout space-time. All right, but what about a proton? Let's think about a proton in curved space-time. All right. Well, the only thing that changes again is charge. The calculation is exactly the same. You have a potential, and it's boring, c squared over the square root of g, zero, zero, zero. You have the exponential metric, but this time instead of just a gm in the, um, in the exponent, you, th you have a, f a square root of gq. Uh, but other than that, calculation is the same. And so we can explain a proton in curved spacetime. Okay, so what did the good professor miss? He was right, in some ways. The, pro the theory works in utterly flat spacetime. Now that's a good thing, because the universe basically is flat. But what the professor was missing was that the theory also works in curved spacetime. We would call this a diffeomorphism. So let me explain that word because it's one of those words that frightened me for a long period of time. There's diffeomorphism invariant theories. That turns out to be really easy. If you write your proposal in, uh, in tensor form, then the form of that equation does not change if you change coordinates. It will work in Euclidean coordinates, it will work in spherical coordinates, it will work in cylindrical coordinates, and the form of the equation doesn't change. 
But there's a deeper type of diffeomorphism that happens in general relativity. There, you have a metric, and you have a mass distribution, and it describes a physical situation. Now, you can come up with a different metric and a different uh, mass distribution and describe exactly the same physical situation. And what you say is that there is a diffeomorphic uh, transformation to go from one to the other. My theory has a different diffeomorphism. I've got the metric, but I'm focusing on the potential. What I've done is shown that with a flat metric and a 1 over r potential, I could explain both a, the neutron and a proton in flat spacetime. That surprises no one. But what I also did was I had a metric that was dynamic, that was curved, that exponential metric that was consistent with every test we have so far of weak field gravity and an utterly boring potential, a static one made up of a bunch of constants and that I could explain the field of a, um, of a point source like a neutron and a proton in this uh, curved spacetime. And it's exactly the same. So there is a diffeomorphism to go from, from the dynamic metric to the flat metric. Now, if my critics ever do the calculation themselves, using pen and paper, they will see that this really is a beautiful theory. It really can do the work of gravity, but in a way very different from general relativity. And once those calculations are done, I have a feeling they will think this theory is as beautiful as I do. So thank you very much. Wasn't that utterly brilliant? Oh, and, well, I happen to be the most brilliant person I knew. Of course, they don't let me out of my cell very often, but really, I mean, I didn't understand a single thing. So he must have been very, very good. Let me give you a sense of how good I am, <laughs> which is really easy to do, but here's one little thing. It's a magic trick I love to do. Alright, so we just do the old reaching into the heart. Do we pull out the rabbit? No! It's my underwear! Ho oh, ho! That's a good party trick! Well, I have to go and uh, dress again, so thank you very much. Rockstar.